Okay, so we're continuing now with another set of interesting NLP applications. The next one is question answering. Uh, let's look at an example of that. Uh, in the Jeopardy game, you get questions in the form of answers. So you get something like the antagonist of Stevenson's Treasure Island, and you're supposed to answer who is Long John Silver. Well, this is essentially the same as asking who is the antagonist in Stevenson's Treasure Island and then have Long John Silver as the answer. This is one of the examples that was actually used in the game that uh, IBM's Watson system played on TV. And just to give an example of how powerful that system is, it's powered by 10 racks of IBM Power 750 servers and has 15 terabytes of RAM, more than 2,500 cores, and operates at 80 teraflops. So this is the kind of system that was used to play Jeopardy in, back in 2011. So here are some of the questions that were used in Jeopardy. For example, on December 8, 2008, this national newspaper raised its newsstand price by 25 cents to $1. The answer is USA Today, and so on. So Watson's answers were 66 correct and 9 incorrect, including one really funny one, which I would like to bring up here really quickly. Uh, the category was US cities, and the question was, Something like this, uh, which city has two airports, one named after World War II hero and one named after World War II battle? Well, the correct answer was Chicago, but Watson goofed and answered uh, Toronto. Now, everybody knows that Toronto is not a U.S. city. The only thing that it has to do with this question is that uh, it has two airports, but they're actually not named after any World War II heroes or World War II battles, and it's not even in the United States. So in this case, Watson made a mistake by not understanding uh, that the category was explicitly meant to refer to U.S. cities. But still, it did pretty well, and it uh, had a two-day winning streak of $77,000. And the two human contestants who had previously been uh, major players and champions on Jeopardy won much less. If you're interested more in the system, we'll talk about question answering in more detail later this semester. And you can also read a lot about it online. Another task in natural language processing is sentiment analysis. So there are many websites where people can enter reviews of products and their properties. So Amazon has reviews. Another website called Opinions has such reviews. I picked an example from there. We have uh, somebody saying uh, what they thought about a camera that they just bought. So we have uh, some statements about the camera. I like the camera, which is a positive statement. Uh, then it says later on that uh, with this camera, I can adjust my images by cropping as I did with my iPad, but better yet. So better yet is another positive thing about the camera. Then there's a sentence about the quality of the images specifically, not about the camera itself, but something more specific than that. I am also quite impressed with the quality of the images. In this case, we have some example of positive sentiment towards a specific aspect of the object that we're describing. Okay, so uh, in the goal of sentiment analysis is to recognize the object that is being discussed and then understand the sentiment, whether it's positive or negative in it. And some of the challenges here are that some of the comments may not be about the object itself, but they can be about some property of the object. For example, the quality of the images, or maybe the screen size, or maybe uh, the zoom, and so on. So one of the hottest areas in natural language processing is machine translation. Imagine that you got an email from your friend in Japan who wrote this uh, text here, uh, which is Akemashite Omedeto Godzaimasu, which is Happy New Year. You don't know what it means, but you can very easily copy and paste this text into a tool like Google Translate and get back an answer, which is Happy New Year. So there are, exist uh, both commercial systems for machine translation, such as Google Translate, but also several open source systems, the most popular of which these days is Moses. Uh, here's a small demo of Moses. It's available at the statmt.org website. So just to illustrate how machine translation works, I ran uh, a short uh, document through Google Translate, and I'm showing you here both the original text and the output. This is a translation from English to French uh, of a text that is uh, relatively difficult. It has a lot of uh, uncommon words. And yet, uh, Google Translate did a very good job. Let's look at some of the examples that I highlighted in boldface on the right-hand side. 
Elephants are social animals. This is very correctly translated as les éléphants sont des animaux sociaux. Uh, the second paragraph starts with a very long sentence that was translated 100% accurately in French, even though it's very sophisticated in structure. Another example of a correctly translated sentence is shown at the end. La psychologie et l'étude des comportements des processus mentaux, which is a, a very difficult sentence to translate, and yet Google Translate did perfectly. However, not everything was smooth. There are also some cases where it did a relatively bad job for different reasons. Let me look at those examples and explain uh, why they're problematic and how Google Translate arrived at them. So let's look at the second sentence in the first paragraph. They live with their families, give hugs, and call each other by using their trunks as trumpets. So in English, we have a sentence that has they as the subject, the elephants, and then there are three verbs, live with their families, give hugs, and call each other, uh, connected with a conjunction and. Well, the French translation has some of those correctly translated. For example, vive, which is uh, to live, third person uh, plural, which matches they. However, the other two verbs are not translated correctly. They're translated as fair and appelé, which are the infinitive forms. They're not conjugated properly for third person plural. And the reason why this is happening is that in English, give and call have the same forms for third person plural and also for the infinitive. Uh, now, in the second paragraph, I highlighted a few words. Uh, the English sentence says, the elephants, comma, with their big brains and survival savvy, may be among the smartest animals on the planet. Well, the translation in French says, les éléphants peut être. So peut-être is singular, as in one elephant, or as in the expression maybe, but it is not translated correctly. It has to be translated in French as uh, peuvent-être, uh, must be, uh, which is a conjugated verb. The third uh, highlighted text is about science news. So uh, this is translated as nouvelle de la science, which is probably a correct translation, but uh, usually people don't want to translate names of magazines like that. Uh, later down, there's an example with everyone, which is translated as les, toutes les personnes, which is a, actually a very good translation. Now, there's a mistake, however, in the following sentence. Plotnik est un psychologue comparatif. So comparatif in French uh, is the feminine form of the adjective. And here uh, the person is male. So the adjective that was uh, supposed to be used here is comparatif with an F at the end for singular. And finally, the last example here is about uh, étude comparative des psychologues, which is a really a mistranslation uh, that uh, can mislead the person reading the document because the original English text talks about comparative psychologists, and here we are talking about a study that compares different psychologists. So this is clearly not uh, the correct translation. The next slide shows you the general way in which machine translation systems work. They uh, use what is known as the noisy channel model. In the noisy channel model, you observe a text in a foreign language labeled as F in this example. Uh, that's the middle portion of the pipeline where you see the little letter F. This F is assumed to have been generated from an English sentence through an encoder from E to the foreign language. You observe F, and then you have to build a decoder that would translate back the foreign language into English. So at the end, you will get a sentence E prime that may or may not be the correct sentence E that was originally translated into the foreign language. And the way that the statistical machine translation works is that it tries to come up with all the possible sentences in English, E prime, that satisfy two criteria. They have to be both grammatical in English and also faithful to the foreign uh, sentence. And by faithful, I mean that the words in the English sentences have to be somehow related to the words in the foreign translation. So we'll talk about machine translation in much more detail uh, towards the end of this course. Okay, so another task in natural language processing is text summarization. Uh, text summarization uh, can be in two different forms. In one case, you have a single document and you want to produce a short version of that document, for example, to display on a mobile device or to process through a text-to-speech system because you don't have time to read the entire document or there's not enough space to show it. 
the second example of text summarization is known as multi-document summarization. In multi-document summarization, you have as input a, a series of connected documents, for example, different news stories on the same event. And the summary should contain um, all the information that appears in all of them as consensus, but also, in many cases, focus on the differences between uh, the input documents. So the example here is from a single document summarization system. I need to warn you that the output that you'll see on the next slide is actually not uh, produced by an existing text summarization system. It is something that you would want to see, but doesn't exist yet. So what's the input? Uh, it talks about the health benefits of a diet rich in vegetables, and it explains why uh, eating vegetables is healthy, what sort of nutrients appear in vegetables, and so on. It gives you some specific examples. And the ultimate summary that you want to get, and again, I'm warning you this is not the output of an existing system, is something like this. Eating vegetables is healthy. We'll see later how summarization systems work. So one of the first summarization systems for news on the internet used to be called News in Essence, and it was developed at the University of Michigan around 2000. Uh, it has uh, since stopped existing, but there are many other systems like this available, including uh, systems at Columbia and uh, uh, Google and Yahoo and many other places. Another application of natural language processing is text-to-speech. So here I'm showing you a link to an external website that you can play with. It allows you to type in an arbitrary text and then specify how it should be rendered. For example, in a male or a female voice, as a native speaker of English or as a Hispanic speaker of English or possibly a different uh, dialect or different uh, nationality, uh, whether you want the person to sound angry or happy, uh, you should definitely click on this link and uh, play with this website yourselves. And there are a lot of companies these days that produce uh, text-to-speech software. I'm just going to mention one of them really quickly here, but there are many others as well. So this uh, is one that uh, I encourage you to take a look at. So another interesting uh, task in natural language processing has to deal with paraphrasing and entailment. You may remember that paraphrasing has to deal with different ways to express the exact same uh, concepts. Entailment is, however, slightly different. Uh, I'm showing you here a few examples from a paper uh, about a recent challenge on recognizing entailment. So let's look at uh, the fourth example. On the left-hand side, we have a piece of text that says, Google files for its long-awaited IPO. And the one on the right-hand side says, Google goes public. So the one on the left is called the text. The one on the right is called the hypothesis. And the question here is, can you infer the hypothesis from the text? So in this case, the answer is yes, because if a company files for an IPO, that means that it is going public. Even though goes public was not used in the original sentence, it's something that is entailed by the original sentence. Now let's look at the example just before that, number three. It says, Regan attended a ceremony in Washington to commemorate the landings in Normandy. So the ceremony took place in Washington assumedly Washington, D.C., the capital of the United States, but it was about the landings in Normandy at the end of World War II. The hypothesis here is Washington is located in Normandy. Well, a silly natural language processing system may make that inference, but it wouldn't be correct because Washington is located in the United States and Normandy is located in France. So in this particular case, the entailment from the text to the hypothesis is actually false. Okay, a few more examples of natural language tasks. Uh, one has to deal with dialogue systems. Let's look at a very realistic scenario uh, uh, of a dialogue. I would like to make a reservation at Sorrento. For when? 8 p.m. Friday night. Uh, we only have availability for 7 p.m. and 10 p.m. Sorry, this don't work for me. So this is a very typical dialogue between a user and uh, either a human being who makes the reservations at the restaurant or a dialogue system that is a computer program that would try to understand the human's questions and answer them appropriately. And there are many other applications. I'm just going to enumerate some of them here. Uh, we'll talk about some of them in more detail in the class, but most of those are based on papers that you can find on the ACL website or uh, in other publication venues in natural language processing. So things like spelling correction, uh, web search, 
uh, natural language interfaces to databases. For example, I'm looking for all the employees who make more than $50,000 and who recently relocated to this state from another state. So uh, this is something that you can very easily express as a SQL query. But if you want to express it as a natural language sentence, then the natural language interface will have to translate it for you into a SQL query. Some other examples of natural language applications include parsing job postings, for example, finding uh, all the postings that look for people with a certain level of experience in a certain state. Uh, summarizing medical records, for example, you have uh, many patients who have undergone the same treatment in the same hospital and you want to look at their medical records and extract information about uh, some of the results from the experiment. Information extraction for databases, uh, social network extraction from text, uh, essay grading, generating weather reports, sports reports, and news stories. All those exist in many different forms in both the commercial world and the research world. Uh, so this concludes the section on uh, different NLP applications. Uh, in the next segment, we're going to look at uh, the NACLO competition.